Welcome everyone. Welcome and thank you for zooming into this third presentation in our year long lecture series intersections of race, class and health. This event, as our previous events, is supported through an endowment from Drs. Henry and Janet Clayman through the Clayman Visiting Professorship in the Medical Humanities. My name is Tess Jones. I'm the Associate Director of the Center for Bioethics and Humanities and Director of the Arts and Humanities and Healthcare Program here at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. Please join us on February 7th for our next speaker in this series, artist Daisy Patton. Um, Daisy will talk about her recent exhibit of embroidered portraits titled, Put Me Back Like They Found Me. These artworks memorialize the girls and women, Black, Latina, disabled, and immigrants forcibly sterilized in the United States. So before I introduce the introducer of our uh, speaker today, please note that you are invited to share questions and comments in the Q&A function. We received many advanced questions. Thank you for those. And that's where we will begin um, in the discussion portion of today's presentation. But we will share all of your thoughts with Ms. Washington after the session. It is now my pleasure and honor to introduce our new Associate Vice Chancellor of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement here at the University of Colorado, Dr. Regina Richards. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones. And thank you to this team who has allowed me to uh, provide this introduction today and to Ms. Washington uh, for being here as well. Um, Harriet A. Washington is a prolific science writer, editor, and ethicist who is the author of Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Experimentation from Colonial Times to the Present, which won a National Book Critics Circle Award, the Penn Oakland Award, and the American Library Association Black Caucus Nonfiction Award. She has also written five other well-received books, including A Terrible Thing to Waste, Environmental Racism and Its Assault on the American Mind, as well as the forthcoming carte blanche, The Erosion of Informed Consent in Medical Research, that will be published in 2021 by Columbia Global Reports. She is a fellow of the New York Academy of Medicine a research fellow in the medical ethics at Harvard Medical School, visiting professor at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, a senior research scholar at the National Center for Bioethics at Tuskegee University, and she teaches bioethics at Columbia University. Ms. Washington has written widely for popular publications and published in Nature, JAMA, the American Journal of Public Health, the New England Journal of Medicine, the Harvard Public Health Review, and the Journal of Law, Medicine, and Ethics. Ms. Washington has also worked as a classical music announcer for public radio and curates a medical film series. It is our distinct pleasure and honor to welcome you, Ms. Washington, on behalf of the Anschutz Medical Campus and bioethics and humanities. We look forward to the time with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Richards, for that very generous introduction. And I'm eager to share with you some of the work that I've been engaged in over the past um, decade or so. And to do that, I'm gonna share some slides with you. Please bear with me for a moment while I do so. And my book, Medical Apartheid, which was um, published in 2007, that's 13 years ago, hard to believe, touches on, it's actually the only book to give a comprehensive um, history 
of the fate of African Americans in ethically troubled medical research. It was actually quite shocking to me to discover that no other text had attempted to do this because it's a voluminous uh, library of um, books about the ethics of human medical experimentation, but somehow the curation of this had resulted in the wide exclusion of African American events and fate. And that means that we have had a very warped view of the history of medicine. And one of the problems in having um, any group excluded and not having their stories told is that one, you know, the history is more than just the past. The past is always with us. And a lot of the events that we're looking at today, that we're confronting today, um, have their roots in the past and frankly reflect um, problems in our logic and in our racial bias, our mythologies that we have never shaken off. We haven't really confronted them because I think we don't really understand how deeply rooted they are in the past. And um, that's what I hope to do. By sharing a bit of the history with you today, I'm hoping to illuminate some problems that we're having today, serious problems, uh, some that affect us all, some that still affect African-Americans exclusively, and show how they are often nothing more than the issues of yesterday with new clothing. So we're still dealing with a lot of the uh, beliefs and the mythologies and the um, frank, frankly um, errors of the past. And um, I'm hoping to illuminate that. And one of the things I'd like to point out at the beginning is that although bioethics discourse, um, you know, often is said to, you know, begin in the 1960s, um, that's the focus. But I always think of it as having actually begun American bioethics um, concerns began in Nuremberg in 1945. The infamous doctor's trial when the Nazi architects of the Holocaust, you know, the quote unquote final solution, um, these were medical doctors who um, chose to pervert their medical knowledge and work to, under the guise of medical experimentation, um, engage in savage abuse and torture of Jews, Poles, Afro-Germans, homosexuals, anyone with whom they didn't agree. And so it was, Amer you know, it was American prosecutors and American doctors who confronted them and told them you cannot do these things. In particular, you cannot force people into medical research if they're not consenting. And they didn't just say you need their consent. They were very specific and at first I thought redundant. The voluntary consent of the subject is absolutely essential. The first tenet of the Nuremberg Code. Why voluntary consent? Why not just consent? Because they acknowledge that consent can be sometimes forced from people. Consent under a condition of um, abuse or um, where there are no good options or where there is a price to pay for selecting an option, coerced consent is not co consent and they knew that. And, but unfortunately, they admitted that when dealing with Nazi quote unquote barbarians, but they didn't admit it when it dealt with what was happening in America at the same time, where you had people, African-Americans in particular, being forced into medical research without their permission. And did the, it applies enslavement too. Um, some apologists will say that a few, a very few of the enslaved people who were research subjects agreed to it. I'm not sure I believe that without written proof, but what I do know is that the conditions of enslavement were inherently coercive and it was not possible to say yes or no to research. So in any event, it began in 1945 and yet it was Americans who were guilty of the same crimes very often who were confronting um, the architects of the Holocaust. And medical apartheid has 15 chapters showing that there was no arena of American medicine where, you, where African Americans were not coerced into abusive experimentation. But one of the things I really want to need to point out today is that Tuskegee is only one of these chapters. Tuskegee syphilis experiment is something that is irrationally invoked whenever African Americans express a fear or concern or a reticent toward medicine, it's trotted out as the excuse. And it's simply not accurate. I think this is done because um, the people who often make this parallel are, are unaware of the other studies. 
All they know is Tuskegee. So they invoke that. But Tuskegee is not a good parallel for most of them. And there are much better parallels. And frankly, although it certainly was um, an abusive situation, I'm going to talk a bit more about later, um, the fact is that it pales in comparison to other studies in which African Americans were frankly um, physically harmed, killed even. Um, so it's not a good parallel, and it's a result of lazy thinking, it's a result of really not knowing the history. And there are other mythologies. Um, people call, people refer to these and the whites and blacks are treated in research arena and elsewhere as biases. And they do constitute a bias, but I think mythology is more appropriate when you're talking about the history because that's what it is. It was beliefs on the part of scientists and physicians that simply weren't borne out by logic. They weren't borne out by fact. They were nothing more than the embodiment of ancient uh, sentiments about people of color that had never been tested with research, the belief that people of color were necessarily inferior to white people, that they occupied a different species, that they were less intelligent. All these beliefs existed before there was any scientific examination of them. And yet when scientists began examining them, they quickly, um, in at, frankly, every decade had scientists who amassed huge amounts of data supporting their contention that African-Americans were less intelligent. The problem is the data were manipulated, frankly false. Um, and Stephen Jay Gould does a masterful job of, of examining many of these. Um, if you look at the bell curve, you find these spidery charts, um, dense with knowledge, but dense with information. Numbers don't mean anything if they've been uh, crudely manipulated or even not so crudely manipulated. And um, it's really important to understand that these scientists have had more than um, um, expertise in science, they also have a political agenda. Um, and to understand that agenda, I think it's helpful to go back to the 19th century. Um, the 19th century is interesting because it's where you had um, a meeting of the ancient biases that up until then had been reinforced by simple proclamations of superiority and religious, you know, perversion of the Bible, you know, finding um, texts in the Bible to say that African-Americans were not really human, that they were built to be subservient to whites. All these things are really powerful had been used, but by the 19th century, you had scientists looking for a better um, explanation or a more impressive explanation. And they were not above taking what they needed from these old biases that had no data backing them up and from the Bible and other sources and coming up with something that was a code of um, basically encoding white superiority, but doing so with the veneer of science. For the first time, they were claiming to have evidence. The evidence would not pass muster today. I mean, it's, we would laugh at it, it's, it was really crude, but the idea that they're first attempting to use science to document and support their belief in African-American inferiority was really important. And when they did so, what they found was not only um, a reinscription of these old beliefs, but also they found that um, a certain belief about African Americans that was very helpful to slave owners, very helpful to the slave system. They held, um, as Europeans had done for a very long time, that African Americans actually were not part of Homo sapiens. They were not part of the human species. They had their own species a bit below human. Most most um, scientists of the time who were revered believe this. The American School of Technology um, has a congregation of these scientists who are very influential and very prestigious. And they, most of them believe this. Most believe that African-American bodies were profoundly different from whites. Um, the African-Americans um, didn't suffer certain diseases and they had diseases that white people didn't get. So they were so profoundly different, their body, they actually had different diseases and different immunities that African-Americans, um, for example, didn't suffer heat illness. They didn't have heat stroke. After all, they were from Africa. They could work long hours without feeling pain. They um, didn't die of malaria and yellow fever as whites might. They believed that African-Americans um, also were not terribly intelligent and had childish judgment. And so they actually needed white people 
and their judgment to care for them. They would quickly expire if it weren't for the tender care of their white owners. All these things were encoded as science by these scientists who purported to tell the world who African-Americans were. So how was, did all this benefit enslavement? Well, because if you had, um, if you're a slave owner and you had these fields in a malarious climate under the hot subtropical sun where whites might have heat illness, whites might die from malaria, whites might die, die from yellow fever, whites might feel pain, um, get too tired. All these things were not any consideration when you're dealing with pe black people. They were not going to get yellow fever or heat stroke. They were not going to feel pain as whites do. So you didn't have to feel guilty about working them unmercifully. All this benefited the slave system. And it's important to understand that doctors were dependent upon the slave system um, for their income and for their uh, social standing. Um, in the 19th century, being a physician was not the precision occupation it is today. And many physicians were having to abandon the profession. They simply could not make enough money to live. Um, so being an, in the employ of a slave owner was the best way to ensure you could make a living wage. In fact, one of these doctors, Josiah Knott, said the best practice is that among slaves. So by supporting the enslavement system, they were also supporting themselves um, and supporting the slave owners on whom they were dependent. So um, one, of, there are a lot of interesting things we could go into here, but I want to stick to the things that I think help illuminate a lot of our attitudes and behaviors today. And one of these is the belief that Black people did not feel pain, which I'll talk a bit about more in the, um, in a few minutes, but I want to point out that whenever you invoke a belief that a certain organism or person doesn't feel pain, you're talking about more than their actual susceptibility to pain. You're talking about their humanity. You're talking about, it's often used as an ethical um, shield to excuse behavior. Um, for example, it doesn't matter what you think about abortion, but I have noted that some of the arguments um, um, in support of the pro-life stance will say, will point out that um, the fetus doesn't feel pain until a certain point of conception. That's code for indicating they don't think that the fetus is fully human until that term. So um, the belief that black people were incented to pain is a very important belief. It also justified a lot of uh, abuse in the medical arena. But then too, there were a lot of other beliefs too, like the diseases that black people had that white people would not get. They were things like hematude, dysthesia ethiopica, juma africana, most of these, oh, and drapetomania. Most of these were diseases that, um, like drapetomania, which was a disease that would cause a slave to run away. So if you were a slave in ancient Greece and Rome, it was normal to run away. But if you were a slave in the Americas and you were black, you now have a potent psychiatric diagnosis. So it was a disease to run away because no um, sane person would leave the, um, you know, the guardianship of a white person where, quote unquote, all their needs are being met. Um, so a lot of things, you know, not only demonizing normal behavior, but you're also saying something about the inherent behavior of African-Americans. Um, so to go forward a bit, another really important aspect of early medicine um, when a lot of it was still transpiring, 90% of um, African-Americans were live in, living in the South, the, almost all of them enslaved until um, you know, fairly late in the 18th century. So during this time, what was their healthcare like? Now the fiction is that African-Americans were treated well, they had good medical care. And one of the arguments is that um, no one would want to have six slaves, you know, you want people who'll be able to work. And that's kind of right, but profoundly wrong, because it's not that, um, of course, they wanted slaves who were capable of working. But frankly, that was the goal. The health of the slave was not the goal. We know that for many reasons. But one example, one important clue is that um, how doctors were paid in the South. If you were attending slaves, you were paid up what we consider a pittance, um, a dollar or two to treat a slave for malaria, which of course, yes, slaves did get malaria. Um, that fiction was useful, but in their everyday practice and doc doctors were more realistic. So a dollar or two to treat a slave. But if you were 
uh, you were paid a lot more for something else, and that was certifying fitness for work. If a slave owner bought a slave, he first wanted a doctor to examine the slave and make sure that slave did not have any illnesses that would keep them from working. And doctor would do that for $50. So if the slave were purchased and then was later found to have a deal-breaking illness that prevented him from working, um, they'd go to court. Doctors were called in again to testify. Again, they'd make um, something on the order of $50. 50 times what they got for keeping the slave alive or maintaining their health. Um, fitness for work, preserving fitness for work was the goal, not, fit, not the health. You know, the Western patient, physician diet, the patient, you know, trusts the doctor. The doctor has a strong sense of responsibility toward the patient. That's beautiful, but it didn't apply to enslaved people. It didn't apply to black people. It didn't apply to people on the plantation. So um, it was um, not the slave, but the planter who was a patient. I say that because it was a planter who hired the doctor, who told the doctor what could and could not be done from, you know, amputations to abortions, um, to treatment. It was a planter who had to be satisfied, not the patient, not, not the um, slave. Nobody asked the slave what they wanted. Nobody listened to their protestation if they didn't want surgery or to be in research. They only listened to the planter. If you had the planter's permission, then you could do whatever you liked with the slave. The belief that black people didn't feel pain was a potent belief and it even spread to England. You can see from these quotes, um, many doctors testifying to the fact that black people did not feel pain. And um, that enabled surgery like that done with James Marion Sims. He was a man who um, became famous after he purported, purported to cure a group of black women of a horrible complication of childbirth called vesical vaginal fistula. Now, vesical vaginal fistula was something that happened because of the prolonged um, labor that some women went into, causing the um, death of tissues um, in the genital area. Horrible, horrible complication. It affected white women and black women, but affected black women more frequently. And Dr. Sims was certain he knew why. It affected black women more frequently because, as everyone knew, they were sexually irrepressible Jezebels who were frequently having sex with anyone. They were dirty. So essentially he was blaming the women for their own condition. The truth was these women had this condition because of enslavement. The poor nutrition led to um, bone deficiencies. And so their pelvis was too shallow to permit the head of the baby to pass during childbirth. Also, these women were on average three years younger than white women when they gave birth because slave owners actively encouraged enslaved women to have children early and often to increase their wealth. Finally, um, well, there are a lot of factors related to enslavement, not to their bodies, but the belief that black people are responsible for their own illness, guilty of their own destruction was a very common one. And you know this belief that um, Black women were uh, sexually irrepressible during the Victorian era was a very damning belief. It had a lot of currency. So here are some images of Dr. Sims and the assistants. Um, it's interesting how art is sometimes used to tell lo beautiful lies about medicine. Because if you look at this, the images on the left and right, the w slave woman is kneeling on a table with her hand held, modestly held to her, her breast. There's a curtain behind her for modesty. And uh, the two slaves peeking behind it don't look frightened. You know, it's like childlike curiosity. They're two surgical assistants and it looks very dignified as if there's a lot of care for her and for her dignity. But that's not what happened in real life. The real image of the surgical scenes were very different. The enslaved woman was naked and the two uh, other doctors were there not just to help in surgery, but to hold her down during her screams and shrieks of protestation. So um, all the women that Sims used were enslaved women. And he used to refer to them later when he was criticized um, during his own time, by the way, he would say that, oh, it was a hospital I set up on my property, but it wasn't a hospital, it was a laboratory. The women were locked in, um, made to work for their keep and they were enslaved. Um, 
when people accused him of forcing them into surgery, he later said, oh, they gave their permission. However, he only said that in reaction to the accusation. And as I, I've stated before, I don't think that even if that were true, which I doubt, they were not in a position to give or withhold their permission. They'd been exported there precisely to be subjects in experiment. And their um, denial probably would not have been listened to and might have been punished. So it's very um, disingenuous to claim that they gave their permission. The image on the right shows a doctor kneeling to tend to a, a white woman um, and averting his eyes, because even being a doctor did not let you look at a, a woman. But in the case of the enslaved women, it's very different. They were naked and Sim sometimes brought in um, men that he knew so they could watch as he you know, perform these distressingly intimate surgeries on them. So white women and, and black women were treated very differently because they were perceived very differently. Whereas black women were held to be um, these irrepressible Jezebels, white women were held to be um, women who did not like sex, but were fiercely protective mothers. Black women were called um, murderously indifferent mothers and the high rate, the very high rate of childhood death and illness on the plantation was held to be the fault of African-American women who supposedly didn't care well enough for their children. Um, so Sims later did not, you know, Sims was defended by many people even very recently, he's still being defended by those who think he was a benefactor. And during his time, he became basically the scion of the New York Academy of Medicine. He um, became president of the American Medical Association. He went to tend to Empress Eugene, and he was lauded as a benefactor and a medical hero. And frankly, I think that's a flaw in our definition of medical heroes because we define our medical heroes based on what we think they've achieved. We don't pay enough attention to them how they got there, who they abused in order to do it. And if you look at our medical heroes, you look at the Pantheon, you'll find many, many people who achieved what they achieved um, based on the savage abuse of African-American bodies. I'm happy to say I was there in 2018 when the Sims of Jane, when the statue of James Marion Sims was banished from Central Park and taken away. So, I want to talk a bit about the spirit, the belief of pain, the belief that Black people don't feel pain, because it's a belief that is still current. There have been uh, studies um, done, quite a few studies have been done over the past few decades, the most recent in 2016, that showed that half of all medical students surveyed believed that Black people didn't feel pain the way whites did. A lot of the um, practicing physicians feel that way too. And um, this very um, potent belief is, um, really troubling. It comes directly from the work of the 19th century doctors. And one of the things that's most troubling about it to me is that these um, students did not learn this from textbooks. You will not find this in textbooks. They learned it as part, a tacit portion of their training. They learned it from seeing how patients were being treated, doctor state, practicing doctor statements about patients. When patients came in in great pain, and doctors dismissed them as probably drug seeking, uh, belittled their pain, um, dismissed them as malingering. Students internalize that. That becomes a tacit part of their training and they go on to do the same thing. I'm, it also disturbs me because pain is something that we are consistently tracking. I'm very sorry that we do a better job of tracking it than actually fixing the problem, but at least we know what's happening and it has been happening consistently. How about all the other beliefs that we're not tracking? the beliefs in Black people being less intelligent, the belief in Black women and Black men being more sexually active and less responsible, uh, the belief in the fact that Black people have um, their own diseases and their own immunity disease that whites don't share. 
basically the belief in biological dimorphism, the belief that whites and blacks have bodies so different that they could actually qualify as different species. We're not tracking those beliefs. And yet I see lots of evidence that we haven't um, completely caught, shown, tossed them off either. I think we still are still in thrall to a lot of these beliefs. If you look at um, black diseases um, that are, we believe in today, you can see we've got quite a few candidates here. A crack baby is especially notable because there was a great deal of brouhaha. There was a lot of um, studies and commentary by physicians validating it. And yet now we know that it was imaginary. And that they, you know, babies who were born to crack and were fated to be golems who would never become fully human. We know that that's a myth. And it was um, embraced. It led to the jailing of many women of color, you know, on the basis they were abusing their kids by using drugs. Um, you know, it was very, very pervasive. And so um, I think we really need to pay more attention to some of these myths and to scrutinize some of these beliefs about um, the profoundly different disease that black, blacks and whites get, especially when we're assuming that um, black people have diseases that white people are not suffering from. And um, as medicine expanded from the plantation into the clinic, we found many things untoward things happening, but um, there's no time for me to talk about all of these, but I wanna, always wanna note that I'm gonna skip past some slides, but if you see a slide that I just skip past, feel free to raise a question about it in the Q&A. Um, the bodies that were used for anatomical dissection were primarily African-American in many parts of the country. Um, this is something that has been well-documented um, when the Medical College of Georgia, for example, was trying to um, remodel its old anatomy laboratory as a museum, they found 9,800 human bones in the basement, discarded training material. 75% of those were African-Americans. Other universities have found smaller but similar cache of bodies. And we also know that Harvard, for example, moved its medical school from um, Cambridge to Boston in order to be closer to the almshouse and the sources of bodies from the poor and African-American. Um, tissue appropriation is still a problem. Um, thankfully, everybody know, now knows about um, the fate of Henrietta Lacks, but now the problem is not procuring um, tissues involuntarily from people who have very unusual tissues like Henrietta Lacks and um, John Moore, who I also write about. Now, the procuring of tissues from people with normal tissues is widespread because there are for-profit companies that make contracts with hospitals to take their um, dis quote unquote discarded surgical tissues and use them for research. And um, patients are often um, inadequately aware of this. And the one study that many people have heard about is the uh, you, public health study at Tuskegee University. Tuskegee had nothing to do with the study. It was a US public health service. But basically there were hundreds of African-American men who were maintained in an infective state. They were lied to and told they were being treated, but they weren't receiving treatment. The idea was for them to die and analyze their bodies, do an autopsy. And there was um, a lack of protocol that made it really hard for many um, people understand what the study was all about. But the study was all about, according to the people who, um, who formed it, it was about trying to prove that an African-American syphilis did not attack the brain and nervous system. It attacked only the muscles. And this is a direct, um, uh, direct result of the 19th century scientists who said that African-Americans didn't feel pain because, and didn't have heart disease because they had profoundly um, inferior neurological development, very primitive neurological system, didn't feel anxiety, didn't feel pain. And when they had syphilis, it would only attack the muscles, basically wouldn't harm their brains because their brains were too disorganized. So you had, you had doctors in 1972 trying to prove the um, claims of these Victorian scientists. And, um, it's really shocking to me that this was the case, and especially shocking that this is so rarely um, 
coupled with descriptions of the study. There are also studies done. Um, in fact, there was, as I said earlier, there was no area of American medicine where there wasn't abuse done with um, African American that was um, abusive, non-consensual, or both. Radiation studies were done. Um, there were quite a few done in this country, especially in the post immediate um, post-war era, or even the um, pre-war era, because the rationale was protecting soldiers. And with that rationale, they were burning the skins of African Americans to see the best way to treat radiation burns um, at universities in Virginia. And in Cincinnati, Clarence Sanger, um, well, Clarence Leshbaugh, the partner of um, Sanger, who connected the studies, um, claimed that the reason they were using total body irradiation on tumors that were radio resistant um, was that first they would say they were trying to treat the people, it was like a last ditch attempt to treat them. And it's irrational. Even their, their peers were saying, but well, they're radio resistant tumors, why are you doing this? It's not going to work. It did, however, kill the people very quickly. And so um, after claiming it was um, therapeutic, then they tried to claim that, no, 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 it was experimental, but we got permission from everyone. And they did indeed produce some permission slips. But one permission slip got the attention of um, a woman who was a granddaughter of, of a subject. And she said, you've a signed permission slip for my grandmother. My grandmother never learned to read and write. So they were called into question. You know, we still don't know whether they actually had permission to do this, but frankly, that's beside the point. Because it was futile treatment, it wouldn't have, would not have helped their clinical state. Um, it's research that should not have been conducted. Prison system was rife with horrendously abusive um, research. Um, the racial composition of the prison system changed over time, but we can't simply trust the numbers because a lot of imprisonment of African Americans was less formal. Um, we know though definitely that um, during the latter years, the research was being done in prisons where African Americans were disproportionately represented. And according to people like Ellen Hornblum, they were used for the worst experiments, the most dangerous ones, the ones least likely to um, um, have a positive effect. And often consent was, they were given no consent. Again, prisons are inherently coercive um, atmospheres, just like enslavement. So I don't think that true informed consent can be obtained in prison anyway, but there are prison systems I talk about in medical apartheid that didn't even try. If a prisoner refused to give permission, then the prison board would simply, quote unquote, give permission for him, which means force him into the research. And some of these were horrible, horribly painful, you know, or even deadly research that was conducted there. So it's been a real nightmare. In the 1970s, prisons were essentially closed to most research. But in 2005, Institute of Medicine um, actually recommended they be reopened, which I find very troubling. I want to switch gears here for a moment and talk a bit about um, some other issues, not just clinical research. And one of them is, um, environmental racism. I think that I've written a book on environmental racism. And one of the things I pointed out very early on in the um, coronavirus pandemic was it struck me that every risk factor um, caused by environmental racism was a risk factor for coronavirus. By that, I mean that if you look at the exposures, heavy metals, lead, mercury, arsenic, um, they all potentiate infection immunocompromise, which is a result of many exposures and the result of the treatment of cancers caused by environmental exposures. That's another risk factor for coronavirus. Nutritional deficiency caused by living in a food desert, or as I call them, food swamp, is another cause of, of coronavirus. As I look through the um, known risk factors, I could not find a single one that was not caused or greatly potentiated by environmental racism. I wrote an article for Nature to that effect. And um, it's, you know, a really troubling confluence of environmental racism, 
and coronavirus infection. The, um, I was concerned that very often when you read about the, um, especially, yeah, read about the literature, trying to, un trying to explain why African Americans were at higher risk of coronavirus, it very often, you know, reverts to that biological dimorphism. Their bodies are different. A French study actually said that African Americans, um, the Africans react differently to the infection than new whites. Um, and you, you saw many physicians um, looking at sometimes quite small, what looked to be tangential differences in uh, reactivity to try to evoke the staggering difference in infection and death rates. Um, but they're not looking at the obvious factors aside from the fact that, as we know, African-Americans were not able to practice social distancing because they were so often essential workers. Um, you also had the fact that they were living on top of these sorts of environmental racism, that they're not being, they're not able to interact with the healthcare system. They're not able to social distance. Um, there were so many very profound and, and, you know, salient factors. And yet the reversion to looking to, for some kind of biological difference is a direct hangover of the 19th century American school mythology um, protestations that black and white bodies were profoundly different and that explains their different health status. Also, I, I have to say this, I say this every day it seems, but um, I'm often, I'm frequently contacted by news media and my medical experts who are writing about this and who will try to, who want me to say that the reason why African-Americans are um, loath to engage with the healthcare system is um, fear of the Tuskegee study. And I always have to say, no, that's not why. Um, it's a four century history of abuse and neglect by the healthcare system coupled with um, various studies that have been, you know, very dangerous to us. Also coupled with a lack of access to the healthcare system. African-Americans are least likely to have their own physicians or to have um, insurance. These are all important factors which are not discussed enough in discussing the coronavirus um, and the difference in infection and death. And another really important aspect of in the pandemic that I also fear is um, getting short shrift is a behavioral aspect. Um, one of the um, really interesting things about um, infection, especially infection um, with, by stranger, um, stranger viruses and bacteria, that is infections to which you don't have any um, resistance, which you're, you're naive, is that people tend to overreact to them. Um, and by that, I mean that there have been a lot of studies showing that we have something called the behavioral immune system. There are animals like Caribbean spiner lobsters and tadpoles who can tell if there's an infected individual nearby. You put an infected tadpole in the water, other tadpoles will swim away from it. Same with lobsters. But for human beings, we don't have any reliable way of seeing if someone has an infection, which we have no immunological defense. We can look and see if a person has a breakout or pustules, and that might signal infection, but we also overreact strongly to people who have a different skin color. So um, we overreact to cues that are not very accurate. And in doing so, we are activating what um, Bruce Schaller calls our behavioral immune system. It, we tend to um, react to people who we think might be carrying infection. We look at not only their skin, we look at their diet. If they eat a different diet than we do, if we know they hail from a, a different country than we do, if they have certain behaviors that um, are not familiar in our culture, these things we tend to conflate with infection. Remember how people were so um, keenly disturbed by the fact that, um, or by the fact that bats were a possible vector in um, coronavirus infection early in the year from China. And they kept, and there was a lot of uh, harping on about eating bats and how dangerous it was and how tainted it was and what primitive behavior it was. And I thought, why all this worry about somebody else's diet? But this is actually an outgrowth of this. It's very normal behavior. It's one of the ways in which people express their heightened xenophobia in the face of stranger infection. Um, 
And the psychiatrist named Gordon Alport in the 1950s actually did a five point scale showing how, the, um, how it progresses. It progresses from shunning and avoiding the people to calling for the expulsion of these people, which we saw in this country very, to physical attacks on them and finally to genocide. We saw all of this here in this country. We saw that um, early on, Asian people were not only being confronted, they were being physically attacked. At one point, there were 100 physical attacks a day on Asian people in this country, often by people who were invoking coronavirus, blaming them for coronavirus, telling them to go back to their own country. And of course, they could not tell who was Chinese. They were reacting to anybody who looked Asian. So we saw this. And quickly, I saw an escalation. This was happening with Asian people, but then soon we saw African Americans also being taunted, told to go back to their country. One woman, an um, elderly woman, I think 86 years old, in a broken um, uh, emergency apartment, was actually killed by another patient who said she wasn't social distancing. 86 year old woman with dementia. Um, dead because she was accused of being a coronavirus vector who was killed. So that we saw um, African-American men wearing masks as they were told to do, some you know, legally required to do it in this case, and they're being chased out of stores by security guards, arrested by police who said they looked suspicious for doing something that everybody else was doing, you know, without question. So there's a conflation here between infection and um, xenophobia that I think we need to make this connection and understand that it's part of um, the pandemic and not a separate issue. So Harriet, this is Tess and you asked me for a five minute warning. So here it is. Thank you. Thanks very much. And to show you how um, Alport, in my opinion, did not exaggerate when he said that this ends in genocide. Um, the fact is that genocidal regimes these uh, fascist regimes, they well understand that fear of infection is a handy genocidal tool, and they've used it repeatedly. The poster on the left was used in Nazi Germany, and I know that 10 years after the war ended, there were still some of these posters up. You could still see them, or um, not everywhere, of course, but they still could be found. Basically, the poster is a microscope, and the field showing on it is little stars of David, hammers and sickles for, for so, so Soviets, uh, pink triangles for homosexuals. All the people they didn't like were being identified as disease vectors. And a lot of the um, propaganda by the Nazi uh, regime focused on Jews as a cause of infection, a vector of infection. When they herded Polish Jews into the ghettos that were way too small, had no or very inadequate hygienic um, facilities, and inevitably they became sick. You know, typhus broke out, other diseases broke out. And then the Germans blamed the Jews for this saying, you see these people, they carry infection with them everywhere. Um, it's their fault for being dirty. So this is the kind of thing that happens. This is where we end up if we don't check. If we don't recognize and check the connection between um, widespread infection and genocide, this can happen. Even the Rwanda conflict in 1994, um, people on the other side, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, are being characterized as roaches, you know, as uh, rats, as disease vectors, and their radio broadcasts urging people in Rwanda to execute them. Um, exterminate them as you would a, a pathogen, as you would a, a rat or a roach. So um, the really important aspect I think might be um, overlooked here. In terms of blaming coronavirus victims for their own illness, that was done very widely with African-Americans and even our own Surgeon General, an African-American man from whom I expected much better, um, invoked um, the need to stop drinking and using drugs and smoking if you didn't want to uh, get coronavirus or spread it. Told people to practice social distancing, although he should have known as Surgeon General that many of the people he was talking to did not have that option. Um, this entire, um, you know, they were in positions where they were essential workers and they had to go to work. They also were people who tended not to be able to practice social distancing. They, don't, they didn't own homes, they didn't own cars, had to use public transportation or they drive public transportation. So all of these things were ignored when he began telling them 
that they needed to change their own behavior. It's again, it harkens back to the 19th century where people were told if African Americans behaved differently, they wouldn't be as ill as they were. And in my book, A Terrible Thing to Waste, I focus on um, environmental racism, but I also focus on an aspect that gets too little attention and that is its relation to cognition. Intelligence, um, education, behavioral problems, all these things are caused by the environmental assaults that African-Americans um, live under. And yet, these behaviors tend to be ascribed to other things. Uh, hereditarians claim that African-Americans um, and others are less intelligent because uh, they have no intelligence at being um, genetically passed on. Okay, that's not true, we get a lot of attention. And although they're scientists, and a few of them are Nobel laureates, and therefore very impressive, they have something else very much in common, and that is the Pioneer Fund. The Pioneer Fund has given millions some of these scientists. It supports almost all of them. In fact, if you look at the Pioneer Fund and its funding, um, you will find the scientists that were praised in the bell curve all through it. They are, it's a, it's a pro-eugenic society that is well bankrolled and it funds scientists who believe in racial um, inequality. Although they are often discussed as if they were scientists and their scientific um, you know, methods and accuracy are discussed, I think it's important to understand they're also politicians. They all have um, desires such as Shockley who wanted to see um, black women sterilized because they're less intelligent. Uh, Richard, Jason Richwine who wanted to see Hispanics barred from the country on the basis that they were, they were low IQ and prone to criminality. These sound like really hoary and ancient beliefs, but they're not. They're contemporary and they're vibrant today and they're being probably get it by very well-funded scientists with, um, in my opinion, more money than scientific logic behind what they have to say. Uh, no time to go into it now, but there's, um, their beliefs have been widely refuted, you know, and I detail all of that in um, A Terrible Thing to Waste. Probably the most amusing is James Watson, who won the 1962 Nobel Prize for finding the structure of DNA. Um, and um, he's very vocal about African-Americans being less intelligent than whites. But a genetic analysis by DECODE that was done almost a decade ago showed that he has an um, African complement in his, in his genotype that's like, um, I think equivalent to having an African-American grandparent is how Kari Stephenson of G DECODE put it. Basically, James Watson is an octoroon. So in American Argo, he would be an African-American, despite his belief that African-Americans are less intelligent, which shows probably nothing more than the illogic of this belief. I'll skip this except to say that um, all the talk about how intelligence is inherited and how there's a 15 point IQ gap that's impossible to close um, is falsified by the, refuted by the fact that in 1924, we closed that gap. Uh, we had a 15 point IQ gap in this country between people who lived in certain areas and others. And when we began adding iodide to salt in order to um, avoid goiters, um, we found a generation later, that 15 point IQ gap disappeared. Turns out it was caused by an iodide deficiency. Um, and iodide is, is necessary to direct brain formation. So you had children, um, fetuses in utero, and young children whose brains were not being formed properly. And iodide deficiency is still the world's greatest cause of mental retardation. So it was, e it was fixed very easily, very cheaply. It cost $2 a ton to add iodide to salt. And so whenever I hear people talk about the futility, how these things cannot be fixed and cannot be corrected, I always think of that. And I realize that uh, futility is, um, sometimes it's true, but more often I I've encountered it as simply an excuse not to do anything. Because if you say that nothing can be done, then some, nothing will be done. And I think that that's a stance that we can't afford to take as we, tr as we try to eliminate racism from our national character. Thanks for listening to me.
Okay, thank you, Harriet Washington, for an incredibly informative, wide ranging, and deeply disturbing presentation. Um, and it is, I add deeply disturbing because I actually wanted to begin, if I could, with one of the questions, uh, one of the advanced questions that we haven't had. Um, from uh, one, one of the participants, and I, I gave you fair warning. This is a, a sort of per personal question, but I, but I'm you know interested in it as well. And how difficult is it, from an emotional and personal perspective, to conduct the kind of research that you do? I'm the perfect person to do this. It's not difficult at all. I love doing it. I feel like um, I don't know. A detective <laughs> or um, someone ferreting out the truth. I think we're having a little trouble um, with your, um, with hearing you and your um, connection. Yeah, you froze for a moment too. I'm not sure what's going on. Hold on. Is that any better? I think so. I think we'll give, give it a try. So you said you're the perfect person because it's so much detective work, which it sounds like a lot of detective work. And I enjoy it. That's why I think I'm the first person to do it. I really enjoy it. Well, let me, and what a question, and we had a number of questions about medical apartheid and you really addressed quite a few of the issues that were raised, but, um, one of the things that you talked about, I mean, it's been since 2007, um, that, um, and so it's been a while, but you said that there was an absence in your mind, uh, in, in, in not only in your mind and the work you were doing about the substantive collection of the events, the ideas um, around some of these issues. Um, was it that gap that really pushed you, compelled you to write the book um, in addition to other, other um, maybe other issues you wanted to confront? Well, I mean, the gap I speak to is a gap in the literature. You know, um, the canon of history of medicine is incomplete. And for Americans, I think I see that as a huge problem. How can we possible, how can we possibly talk about, you know, the historical roots and the re present day reality, of what we're facing, if we've never confronted, never admitted that it's there. But what really caused me to do this um, was an experience that I had back in the 1980s. Um, and it was really interesting. I was, I was managing an apartment in a hospital, which was kind of a, I don't know, like a poor stepchild of a real medical department. It was a poison control center, right? And it was a lot of fun. I really loved that job. And we had, um, some new equipment, not new, it was like used equipment that had been given to us. And I had these old file cabinets. I was trying to empty them out so I could use them. And I found some old files from the 1970s that had been forgotten, obviously. And being me, I read every one of them, right? <laughs> so, and as I read them, I was chilled. These were files of kidney patients who are awaiting transplant, who are, um, and kidney transplantation was not very, was fairly new at the time the files were done. Bottom line is that there were two types of files. Some of them were very thick and they had lots of documentation, including social documentation, documenting the person's uh, case for getting a transplant. You know, not only are they um, physically appropriate, but um, they have a loving family, social support, they have insurance, you know, making a case for the person. Other files are very thin, very little information. Um, and so, so you would think that the files, thin files would be of people who basically were maybe um, homeless or just, you know, quite, had no insurance, whatever. But actually what I, thought, I found the difference was that um, I only looked at a few files. I'm not pretending that this was a, a scientific assessment, but the files that I saw, they were African-Americans. 
had very thin files, and one struck me in particular because it was so blunt. This person had insurance. He had a loving family, very stable sociologically, you know, no, nothing negative there. He had no drug problems, alcohol problems, none of the things that would normally you think would exclude somebody. And the um, a medical staff person had written the plan for that person was to help him prepare for his imminent demise. That was so chilling. But what really bothered me, and I could not sleep that night, I remember, I was signed by a doctor I knew. Mm -hmm. I knew this doctor socially. He was a wonderful man, you know. Um, he was very different. Um, I know he was he was Christian. He was um, had a very unusual background for a doctor, very erudite. But I thought of him as a very caring person. The person I knew was very caring and very loving. And I'm thinking he could never have signed that, but yet he had. So I was, um, you know, a little bit shaken. And as time went on, I just looked for more evidence. Like, how often is this happening? You know, it was like one little case or a couple piles. Or is it, and I, I suspected working in the hospital, as I had for a long time, because you could see racial bias everywhere. Um, in the staffing, there were very few, you know, medical personnel there then um, who were African-American. And so the more I looked, the more I found. I wasn't a writer then. I didn't know I was going to end up writing a book about this, but that's why I started. And I knew I would do it when I went to a history of medicine conference in Lübeck, Germany. It was billed as international, but it was all it was Americans, Russians, um, people from Europe, nobody from Asia, nobody from Africa. International conference, and I told and I told these guys, I said, "Listen, I'm doing this book on medical experiments with African Americans," and they all, to a person, said. Oh, nothing happened, you know. I said, well, yes, I found quite a bit. Oh, no, maybe Tuskegee, that's it. They were all so certain that there was nothing there to discuss. And then one of the people who told me that, I knew of him because he had written a, what I thought was a brilliant book about um, abusive medical experimentation by Germans in their East African colonies. I'm thinking, well, how can you be so sure? I mean, you've done this voluminous book on the same subject elsewhere, you know? But anyway, I knew at that point I was going to write the book because I thought, um, you know, it just, it just can't be that these experts are either ignorant or maybe willfully ignorant of this history, so. Well, you have made such an important Un, I mean, it, 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 such an important and lasting contribution to, you know, to the history of medicine, to the, to a much more informed discussion around these issues. I'm, we will be sharing all of the thank yous and the comments and the questions with you um, after we, you know, after we end our session today. Thank you again, Harriet Washington, for spending some time with us. We look forward to your next book, and we're so grateful that you're out there doing the work that you're doing. Um, especially, and we got a lot of questions on informed consent, so I think that this next book is very, very timely. I want to thank Dr. Richards for participating uh, with us. It was just, it was such a delight that I got to connect Harriet Washington and Regina Richards. This is, you know, this is what keeps me going. Thank you. Take care, stay safe. And we look forward to, to you know, to seeing your work in the future. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Richards. You're welcome. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Take good care.